himself together with his people by saying, I will be thy God and thou shalt be my people. That is a fetter. That is a covenant. And God made an unconditional covenant with David. Now there are three things in this covenant that God promised to David. And these are literal. They are not to be spiritualized away or allegorized away. Amen. They are real. They are literal. Here are the three things that God promised to King David of Israel. Number one, a house. I will make thee an house. That's referring to David's posterity. It's a dynasty of his family throughout the ages. Secondly, a throne. The throne of David. It is his kingship over Israel. David was a great king. And he sat on the throne and ruled Israel. The third thing that God promised to David was a kingdom that is a political rule that he would have a dynasty and a rule and sit upon a throne. Now, there are those today who are well-meaning, well-intentioned, but they're quite wrong in their view of the Davidic covenant. They believe that it's a spiritual covenant that it's not real, it'll never happen. We don't agree with that. We believe that when God spoke these literal promises to David in the form of a covenant which he ratified, that he would fulfill them. And David will one day come back and he will reign over Israel. Christ will reign over the world. David will reign over Judah as he did when he was here upon the earth. Now, disobedience would bring chastisement, but it would not break the covenant. <clears throat> there are those that teach us that because of their disobedience to God that he broke the covenant with them. God never breaks a covenant. Right. And he did not break his covenant with David or with Israel. His covenant was reaffirmed even after repeated disobedience. The provision of the Davidic covenant was that David was to have a son who would succeed him and establish a kingdom upon this earth. David one day was sitting in his palace and he was musing and he got to thinking about the Ark of the Covenant which was housed in a tabernacle of curtains and it didn't seem right to David for that precious object that had been carried through the years by Israel, that it should be in a house of curtains while he dwells in a palace. So he decided that he would build a house for God. And he made a presumptuous plan and he was mistakenly encouraged by Nathan the prophet. He told Nathan what his plan was. And Nathan said, yes, that's a good idea. You go right ahead. Do it. And then Nathan went out from the palace. And David is thinking now, how am I going to build this palace or this house for God to have a place for the furniture of the tabernacle to reside. And Nathan 
only got about 40 feet away and God stopped him. He said, you go back and you tell David, I have never asked anybody to build me a house. I don't want anybody to build me a house. You go back and you tell David he is not to build me a house, but his son will build me a house. And you tell David that I will build him a house. He's not to build me a house. I will build him a house. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan the prophet, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house that's a royal dynasty, a political house, a royal tribe, and when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom, and thine house, and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. In Zechariah chapter 6, we read these words of the Lord. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, that's Christ, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and sit and rule upon his throne and shall be a priest upon his throne. A king priest. That was unheard of. It was legal for a man to be a king. It was legal for a man to be a priest. But it was illegal and unacceptable for a man to be both a king and a priest. He could not hold both offices. And yet here is one called the branch. And he is going to combine within himself both of the offices. He will be a king and he will be a priest. Something unheard of in Israel. Solomon was never a priest. He was a king, but never a priest. But this one prophesied here in Zechariah 6 will be a king priest. And it was written after Solomon's temple. And God makes known to David's son that a Messiah would not only be a king and a priest, but after the order of Melchizedek, who was a king priest. Now Bishop Horsley has translated this verse to read as follows. O Lord God, Thou hast spoken of Thy servant's house for a great while to come, and hast regarded me in the arrangement about the man that is to be from above, O God Jehovah. That's a good translation. David is told that he's going to have a son who will be a king priest and who will reign forever. And then David is speechless. He cannot understand what magnitude a blessing God has just pronounced upon him and his royal house. And he says, O Adonai Elohim, who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? 
And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God. But thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of man, O Lord God? David is musing. He is saying, I could understand how I could have a throne that would last forever. But to have a son to sit on that throne who is both a king and a priest, what a man. What a man. That's what David is musing. I just cannot take it in. Such a man will be my son. David is overwhelmed with awe at such a promise, such a covenant. You'll remember when the Pharisees tried to trap Jesus with a question. He answered with a question for them. In Matthew 22 and verse 42, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, say, what think ye of Christ, that is the Messiah? Mm -hmm. Whose son is he? That is, when Messiah comes, whose son will he be? And those Pharisees say, well, ha, ha, that's easy. He'll be David's son. And they were right about that. It is David's son who will take the throne when he returns. Of course, there's a question here. How then, here's Jesus' question to them, how then does David in spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? How could he be the son and the Lord at the same time? They had no answer for that. David's son is going to be David's Lord. How could he be David's Lord and son both? The answer to that is found in Revelation 22 and verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. He's saying, I am the creator of David and I am the offspring of David. Now how could that be? If Jesus is the root of David, then David came from Jesus in creation. And if Jesus is the offspring of David, then Jesus came from David in his lineage as a man. So Jesus is David's creator, his root, and by his birth through the seed of the woman through Mary who was of David he is the offspring of David you see the wisdom of our Lord was beyond these Pharisees Amen. it is beyond ordinary men the divine omniscience of God to work out such a thing and yet make it perfectly legal. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 30 through 33, we have proof that Jehovah's promise to David refers to Jesus. So I'll read it. Verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. 
And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. In other words, Jesus came from the lineage of David. He is David's greater son. Now David had other sons, Solomon and Nathan and so on. But this son is going to be a king priest. He's going to rule someday. And during the ministry of Jesus, he was recognized by some as the son of David. The blind man in Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus departed thence, Two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou, son of David, have mercy upon us. He was recognized when he performed miracles in Matthew 12, 23. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Then he was recognized again at his triumphal entry in Matthew 21 9 and multitudes went before and that followed cried saying Hosanna to the son of David blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord Hosanna to the highest then he was recognized by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 and verse 3 concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David. That is, he was the son of God and he was the son of David. He was the son of God from all eternity. And he was the son of David by his virgin birth of Mary. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. And Paul also affirmed that to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.8. Remember, he said, that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So who is, who, who is David's greater son? Not Solomon. Not Nathan, not Adonijah. The greater son of David is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the one that's going to come and take the throne of David and rule the nations with a rod of iron. Now we come to another question. Why does Jesus have two genealogies? Mm. Two. He had to have two. And I'll show you why. He has a genealogy in Matthew. Matthew chapter 1. You have the genealogy of Jesus. As he came through the lineage of David. Then in Luke. The third chapter. You have the genealogy of the Lord Jesus. So there are two genealogies. One in Matthew. And one in Luke. They don't contradict one another, and yet you would think that they would, but they do not. Because the Messiah had to come through the lineage of David. No man could sit on the throne in Israel unless he came through the lineage of David. He had to come through David's line. He couldn't come through some other line. He had to come through David and Solomon. But 500 years after David, David's dead, gone to heaven, there's a man by the name of Kaniah. Kaniah was also called Jeconiah. He was also called Jehoiakim. He had three different uh, appellations of names. He was a Judean king during the captivity and he came under the curse of God. 
Now, being under the curse, he could not sit on the throne. He was displaced from the throne because of the curse of Kaniah. Kaniah was kicked out. And another man took his place. What was the curse of Kaniah? It was because he was of the seed of Ahab and Jezebel. And because of his seed line, Ahab and Jezebel, he could not take the throne. But if Jesus came through his line, then Jesus could not take the throne. So we see a problem. And we read about this man, Kaniah. Is Jeremiah 22, verse 28. Is this man, Kaniah, a despised, broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out? He and his seed, for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling anymore in Judah. Jeremiah predicted that Jehoiakim would never have a descendant on the throne of David. He died childless as to the throne. Not one of his seven sons ever succeeded him because they were all under the curse. In him, the scepter departed from Judah. He was the last Judean king. His name that took the place of him was Zedekiah. Now, if Christ came through the lineage of Caniah, he could not sit on the throne. He could never be the king of Israel because that line was under a curse. Now, there's a problem here. Joseph, who was not his real father, came through this line, the line of Caniah. But God placed a curse on that line and said no man can ever sit on the throne of David if he is of the lineage of Caniah. The Solomonic line ends with this man, Caniah. Now we have a big problem here. How does God get around this problem? He switches over to another son of David whose name was Nathan. Nathan was actually older than Solomon. And the royalty passed over to the line of David's son, Nathan. God solved the problem. God just switched over to another son, Nathan. So Jesus came through Mary, and Mary came through Nathan, and Nathan came through David. So the line was preserved, and Jesus could still ascend the throne because he was on the lineage of King David through Mary. And so he came through Mary's lineage. He was not affected by that curse. When David placed Solomon on the throne, there's something interesting here. By right of primogeniture, that is being the oldest son, Nathan was older than Solomon. By right of primogeniture, Nathan should have been the king of Israel, not Solomon. But, when Solomon was placed by David as king in his place, Nathan never said a word. And yet by the right of primogeniture, it was his right to become the king of Israel. And he didn't. He allowed David to put Solomon on the throne that he 
was in in the lineage to receive, and he never said a word. And if you will ask me the question, who kept Nathan's mouth shut? Wouldn't anyone want to be the king of Israel? Nathan had the right, but Nathan never said a word. You know who kept Nathan's mouth shut? The one that shut the mouths of the lions in Daniel kept Nathan's mouth shut. And Solomon became the king of Israel in David's place. And through Solomon and Nathan and Mary, Jesus will be the king priest, David's greater son, who will come and reign. Luke gives us the line, line of Mary, the daughter of Heli. And through Nathan, God preserved the bloodline of David while avoiding the curse of Coniah the very wisdom of God to work out an insoluble problem was no problem for God. You see, God knew all the time that he was going to bring Nathan into being. He knew all the time this was all going to take place. And he knew all the time that Nathan would be the one who would take over the seed line. And so what we have here is Luke tracing Jesus' real pedigree backward from Mary, his true parent, through Nathan to David. So by bloodline, Jesus comes through Mary, which connects Nathan to David and connects him to David by Nathan. Then, with Joseph being his foster father, not his real father, his legal father. You see, Joseph had legal rights to the throne because he came from another line. Then Joseph being the legal foster father through marriage to Mary gave the legal right of the throne to Jesus. So, he had the legal right through Joseph, who was not his father, except legally. When he married Mary, Joseph then gave the legal rights to Mary's child. The legal rights. And Mary, being of the bloodline of David and Nathan, gave the bloodline. So, by that, Jesus had the right by the legal and by the bloodline, both. And both were necessary because of that curse of Kaniah. What an amazing thing is the wisdom of God. And it's important, this divinity covenant is important because there are men today in Jerusalem who are claiming to be the son of David, of his lineage. But the people in Jerusalem will not accept them. They're phonies, they're frauds, and the people know it. Because in AD 70, Titus, the Roman general, marched into Jerusalem, sacked the city, burned it, and destroyed it, and all the records and the genealogies were burned up. So today, no Jew in Israel knows his tribe. He doesn't know which tribe he came from. There's only one tribe that knows who they are. And that's the Cohens. Cohen is a Jewish name. The Cohens are the original Levites who took care of the furniture of the tabernacle. So these men today claiming to be the son of David in the lineage of David 
are found to be phonies because they cannot prove their lineage. There's only one person in all the universe that can lay a valid claim Amen. to the throne of David, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. He is the only person that has the lineage legally and by bloodline. No one else can do that but him. Amazing is this Bible. An amazing Bible. Now, there are those that question the reign of Solomon. They say the reign of Solomon was interrupted. Yes. There has been an interruption of the lineage. King after king after king after king. All from the lineage of David. But, because of sin, the, the lineage was stopped temporarily and no other kings took place so for over 2,000 years now Israel has not had a king right. Israel is a theocracy a theocracy is a nation being ruled by a king but today and for the last 2,000 years since they crucified their Messiah they have had no king they have a president. That's a far cry from the king. And this is important because in the Davidic covenant, Christ being the only one that can lay claim to the throne of David, all others are frauds. It can be interrupted, but not forever. It's a temporary interruption. It's lasted nearly 2,000 years. But there's a day coming when David's greater son, the son of David, is going to come down from heaven and he's going to take the throne of David and rule the nations with a rod of iron. Because Nebuchadnezzar had captured Jerusalem later taken all the people captive and he had put Zedekiah on the throne illegally the throne line had been interrupted Zedekiah was placed on the throne and God didn't, didn't hold with that what God did was he said this in Ezekiel 21-26 he pronounced judgment upon King Zedekiah he said, you have no right. The Solomonic line has been interrupted. You have no right to take to have Nebuchadnezzar put you to begin there as a king. I am the one who puts the kings in. He setteth up kings and taketh down kings. I did not put Zedekiah on the throne. Nebuchadnezzar did that without any right whatsoever. Therefore, he brought a curse down upon Zedekiah and the throne remains empty. If you look at your bulletin, if you got a bulletin, look at the picture on the front. There is no king sitting on David's throne today. And there won't be until the son of David comes to take the throne. And in Ezekiel 21, 26, Thus saith the Lord God, Remove the diadem. Now in the Hebrew, that word is a mitre. The mitre is the headdress of the high priest. And he said, take off the crown, which represents ruling authority. The throne represents ruling authority. And when God rejected and stripped the mitre from the priest and the crown from the king, he was bringing about the interruption temporarily, which has lasted 2,000 years. And he says, take off the crown. This shall not be the same. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. And it shall be no more until he come.
whose right it is, and I will give it to him. What is God saying? Zedekiah, get out of here. You have no right to sit on this throne. I'm going to bring David's son down from heaven. He's going to sit on the throne. I'm going to give it to him whose right it is, who has the legal right to it. I'm going to give it to the one that has the legal right. You don't have a legal right to it. Notice the word until. Until he come. That means he's going to come. Until he come. Until. Until. Until what? Until he comes whose right it is. Messiah will come and take the throne of David. When Jacob lay dying, he pronounced a prophetic blessing upon his twelve sons. And in Genesis 49, 10, he said this, the scepter, that's the authority to rule on the throne, shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Right. Who is Shiloh? Shiloh is Jesus. Yes. Shiloh is Jesus, David's greater son. Until Shiloh come, and to him shall the gathering of the people be. So from Judah, the tribe of David will be the royal line through Nathan. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. In Jeremiah 33, in verse 17, For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, If ye can break my covenant of the day, that's the seasons, and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season. If you can overwhelm my, my use of the seasons, if you can overwhelm my power to bring about the seasons, then also my covenant can be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne. In other words, if you can overcome my omnipotence and stop me from bringing the sun up every morning and stop me from bringing the sun down every night, if you can do that, then I'll break my covenant with David. But until you can do that, David's son will have the throne. Now, coming to a close, Solomon build a house for the Lord. It's called Solomon's Temple. For 900 years, in 900 B.C. rather, it stood for 500 years. And then it was destroyed. About 400 years later, Zerubbabel's temple, temple was built. And it stood from 515 for about 450 years. And then it was enlarged and beautified by Herod, and it became known in Jesus' day as Herod's temple. So for 2,000 years, and it was destroyed in 70 A.D., by the way, for 2,000 years, Israel has had no temple on the earth. They have had no king. They have had no way to approach God because they crucified their Messiah. David's greater son on the cross of Calvary. And today, there's going to be a temple rebuilt soon. And in the tribulation period, which is around the corner from us, the Jews are going to rebuild the temple and the Antichrist is going to destroy it. That's Revelation 11.1. Today in Tel Aviv, classes are being taught to the Kohens, that's the Levites, 
pertaining to the offering of animal sacrifices in the future temple to be built during the tribulation period. I would tell you this morning, we are so close to these events transpiring now. We've waited 2,000 years for David's greater son to come. And he's coming. The tribulation period is coming. The temple is going to be rebuilt and destroyed by the Antichrist. And I want you to know that Jesus is not sitting on David's throne now. Oh, David. David. Where is your son? Well, the amillennialists say he's sitting on David's throne in heaven. No, he is not. No, he is not. Well, you say it says it. No, it doesn't say it. Let me read it to you. Jesus is not sitting on David's throne now. And here in Revelation chapter 3, and verse 20 is the proof that he is not. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Jesus speaking. Even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Now how many thrones do you get out of that? One? No, you get two. There's two thrones here. The Father's throne and the Son's throne. There's two thrones there. Jesus is not sitting on His throne today. He's sitting on the Father's throne with the Father in His place as the third, as second person in the Trinity. But when He comes again according to all of these scriptures that are prophesied, then he will sit on David's throne. And then God will once again start the lineage of sitting a king on the throne. But it won't be king after king after king. It'll just be one king. Amen. King David. So will be occupied by David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. David's throne is an earthly throne. It was an earthly throne when it was a throne down here. It will be an earthly throne when Jesus comes back for, to this earth and sits on David's earthly throne and rules the nations with a rod of iron. David's throne. Now I close with this. 2 Samuel 7, 14. And the immediate reference is to Solomon. But it goes beyond Solomon to the Lord Jesus Christ prophetically. And I read in verse 14, I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Notice the stripes of the children of men. When Did he take hold of a name? On the cross, he took hold of iniquity. He opened his arms to the punishment of Almighty God and to the wrath of Almighty God. He opened his arms and received it. He took hold of it. And what did he take hold of? The guilt and the sin that you and I had committed. This is talking about Solomon, but it goes beyond Solomon to Jesus Christ Himself. That's when He took hold of iniquity, and that's the way that should read by Bishop Horsley. He says, when guilt is laid upon Him, I will chasten Him with the rod of men. And they chastened Him with a whip, with the stripes of the rod of men. He was punished for iniquity. But whose iniquity? 
my iniquity, your iniquity. Jesus laid hold of the guilt and the sin that we had committed and he was punished by the stripes of men on the cross of Calvary with nails in his hands and a spear in his side and he bore it all for you and I. For he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, he who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, I want to go back in closing to David. David, you're dying. You're on your deathbed and you're dying and you've got to set somebody on the throne and you've got to know where you stand with God. David, you murdered a man. David, you committed adultery. David, during your reign, you slew many men. You are a bloody king, David. But God forgave you. And I want to ask you, David, now that you're dying, do you have any hope? And David said, yes, I have hope. Well, David, I'd like to know what your hope is. Is it because you reigned as a king all those years? No. Is it because you spoke nicely about the Lord? No. Well, David, what is your hope then? A man that's done the bad things that you did, what is your hope? You know what his hope was? The Davidic covenant. Listen to this. It's from his own mouth on his deathbed. This is his hope. 1 Samuel 23, verse 5. These are the words of David. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and sure for this is all my salvation and all my desire this covenant God made with me is all my salvation and it's all I want that's what he said so you see the importance of the beginning covenant. He said, it's all my salvation. Nothing else. Just the beginning covenant. And what is the covenant? The promise of God. And you might be saying this morning, I know God made a great covenant with Noah. He made a great covenant David I wish that he make such a covenant with me I wish God would make a covenant with me like that and promise me everlasting life well if you're wishing that God would make a covenant like that with you I can tell you some good news he already has he already has. And I'll read it to you in closing. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. You've got it now. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. John 3, 36. That's your covenant from God. He's already made that covenant with you if you're a believer. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. 
you've got the covenant right there. All you got to do is believe on the Son, and you've got everlasting life. And it's yours. And that's all your salvation. Just like David said, it is all my salvation. What a wonderful covenant God has made with David. And what a wonderful covenant He has made with you and I. That His promise is all our salvation. Let's stand together, please. We just in prayer. Don't forget our evening service tonight at 6 o'clock. Brother Kim will be preaching and each Sunday night thereafter. So you'll be here at 6 o'clock. Hear a good message. And as we bow together in prayer, we have donuts and coffee out there. We'd like for you to stay behind and have a little time of fellowship if you have the time. As we bow together in prayer, Brother Kim, would you dismiss us, please? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the word of promise to us in the covenant through the King David and through the Jesus Christ. But no matter what we do, even we are in equity, and even we are sure of your glory, but your endurance and your loving kindness and grace always abundant for us. You never lie to us, and you promise to us. Thank you so much, Father. May we turn our call because you promised to us your covenant. Father, let us listen to you always in obedience to you and abundant for life what you promise. Father, thank you so much for your blessing for us today. Thank you so much, our pastor. Thank you so much, our congregation. We pray in Jesus Christ. Amen.